Hey, good afternoon and good morning. Welcome to the Charlie Mike 22 webinar series hosted by the National Veterans Small Business Coalition. Thank you for joining us today. This webinar is brought to you by BAE Systems and Philips North America. Both of these companies made this webinar series possible. Uh, just a few announcements. Uh, we are less than a month away from the NVSBC Edu Education Foundation Charity Golf Tournament. will be held on, a, on August 22nd at Arlington, Virginia at the Navy, Army Navy Golf Course. If you want to come out and network with your favorite, with your, what's your favorite? <laughs> when you come and network with your fellow business owners and, and like-minded people, this is a great way to play golf and, and network with fellow business owners. So, so please come out and join us and I hope to see you there. This is the Charlie Mike schedule for August. And that's including the session with how to do business with the Navy. We are going to be moving to a new platform. And instead of downloading go to we go to webinar, we're going to be starting to have these webinars on MS Teams. So look out for the link for these webinars. And if you have any questions on how to get to them, just send me an email. And of course, you can find us on YouTube. Just subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you're missing any any back episodes of Charlie Mike 22, or even back to Charlie Mike 21, we have Vets 20, and we also have a number of special veteran-focused special events and testimonials. So please, please add yourself to our YouTube channel. Okay. Today's webinar is an hour and 15 minutes. It's being recorded and all slides and recording will be sent to all attendees by Monday. If you have any questions during this webinar, please type it on the right hand of your screen on the control panel. So I am Earl Morgan, I am moderator for this webinar and I'd like to welcome a very good friend of ours and a supporter of the NVSBC, Ms. Maria Pancelli. She's going to talk about, of course, everybody's favorite subject, protest. <laughs> so, Maria, the floor will be yours in about a few seconds. Thank you so much, Earl, for that lovely introduction, and thanks to everyone out there joining us, and I guess everyone out there watching it on YouTube later. Uh, I'm happy to be here today to talk about bid protests and about kind of the, the debriefing and, and other considerations that go along with protests. As, Ed, or as Earl said, my name is Maria Panicelli. I'm a partner at McCarter and English. You can see my contact information on the screen. Um, this information will be shown again at the end of the presentation as well. You can feel free to reach out to me if you've got questions that you don't feel comfortable asking during the webinar today, uh, you know, in a public place, or if there's questions that we don't get to, or, you know, if you have a question that comes up a, a week or a month or a year from now, you can feel free to, to reach out. My uh, background and, and my practice focuses exclusively on federal government contracts. Um, that kind of uh, runs the gamut throughout the entire procurement cycle, and I, I help contractors that are primes and subs across a variety of industries doing business with you know, any number of, of federal agencies, both executive and legislative. Um, and I help with kind of anything that comes up. But I would say the, the most common practice areas and the things that come up most often in my practice are REAs and claims and the CDA claims litigation, uh, performance and compliance counseling, which includes you know, when an issue pops up during performance of a contract, but also includes things like the Service Contract Act or the False Claims Act or the Buy American Act, or you know, last year, the executive orders dealing with COVID, anything that kind of is counseling you on how to get through issues that come up either through performance of a specific government contract or just by virtue of being a government contractor um, and how to do that and preserve your claim rights and make sure that you're compliant and not leaving yourself at risk uh, to any sort of enforcement actions. I do a lot with small business procurement, um, you know, the 8A, hub zone, women owned, but of course, veteran owned and, and service disabled veteran owned programs, size and status protest, eligibility analysis, analyses, teaming, mentor protege, et cetera. Um, and then of course, uh, you know, subcontracting issues and, and terminations. And what 
Finally, what we're going to be talking about today, bid protests, and I help clients both on the, the protester side and on the intervention side, and we're obviously going to talk about both of those as we move forward today. So today's agenda, we're kind of breaking protests into 10 top tips uh, to keep straight. I'll try to say that five times fast. Um, and, and, and if you can kind of get your head around these concepts, um, I think it's going to help you identify the most important kind of periods that come up and the catalysts or events that trigger your obligation to do something and you know how to to meet a deadline and you're going to know when it makes sense to reach out to an attorney and you know how quickly you have to do it so that you can either you know defend if you're you know if someone else protests your award defend the award that you were given and, and try to keep it or utilize bid protests in the way that they were intended if you think one of your competitors unfairly got a contract that you should have been awarded. That's really the point of today's presentation. Um, like I said, if you've got questions, you can feel free to ask them um, you know, either offline later, you've got my information, or feel free to pop them in the box, like Earl said, and we're gonna try to leave some time to answer a bunch of the questions at the end. So the first tip I wanna start with is to keep your types of protest straight. There are different types of protests, and sometimes you'll just hear people say protest. You know, I was protested, or I'm gonna file a protest. But that's a little bit misleading because not all protests are created equal, and not all protests are dealt with in the same way. We are focusing today on bid protests. That is when a contractor who kind of, you know, would have or did compete for a job and did not get it, raises a challenge to the award or awards, if it's a multiple award situation, given saying, hey, the agency did something wrong here. The agency didn't follow applicable law. The agency didn't uh, you know, act in a way that was consistent with what the solicita solicitation excuse me, said they were going to do. So it's a question where the contractor is the protester, um, and they raise a challenge to the agency's behavior and evaluation process. That is different than size and status protests. What is similar between bid protests and size and status protests is that they are initiated by a contractor, initiated by someone who either you know, was a competitor uh, you know, seeking the contract award or, or would have been if whatever error they're alleging had not happened. But the challenge isn't to the agency's decision or the agency's process in going through evaluation and award, but rather is a question of whether or not the company was eligible in the first place to even be in the running for award. You know, hey, this is a small business set aside and they're not actually small, they're affiliated with another company. Hey, this is a service disabled veteran owned set aside and this guy who's, you know, the vet is really not in control of his company. He's being controlled by his brother-in-law's large company. He's just a spin-off, and you know that's affiliation and control, and he's not a valid SDVOSB entity. Those are the types of things that are raised in size and status protests. We're gonna be focused on bid protests today, but you're gonna see in a couple places, I'll kind of point out, hey, you know, keep in mind, this is a little bit different when you're dealing with size and status protests. Um, and obviously, if you have questions about size and status protests, you can feel free to, to reach out to me to talk about them as well. But it is very important to keep them straight. And you know, if you're on the protester side, it's important to keep it straight so that you know what you are filing, because where you file and when you have to file and what grounds you are arguing and what type of research you need to do um, you know, and, and what you need to do in terms of hiring a lawyer, et cetera, is gonna be different if you're asserting a bid protest as opposed to if you're filing a size and or a status protest. And if you're on the awardee side, if you've gotten the award and now you've been protested, there are big differences in terms of how you respond and how the government responds and who has kind of the laboring or in terms of formulating that response. So very important to understand kind of what world you're in, whether you're the protester or the protested company. Okay. The next thing I wanna talk about is to just kind of go over the bid protest fundamentals. Bid protests are a topic that a lot of people uh, have, you know, have heard about, especially if you've been in the federal marketplace for a long time. I'm sure you've heard stories or possibly even been involved in protests. But two things, like a lot of things with federal law or federal 
procurement law, I should specify, um, you know, the regs change and, and things can be a little bit different and, you know, far deviations can come out and company or, you know, agencies can start doing different things in terms of the way that they, uh, you know, their policies about debriefing, et cetera. So even if you've been involved in a protest in the past or if a colleague or a peer of yours has told you about their experience, you don't want to assume that that's the same situation you're in, both because the law changes, but also because as you will see as we go forward, there's a lot of differences where the devil is in the details and depending on what type of protest you're filing and you know where you're filing it, the situation could be completely different. You don't want to rely on thinking that you're, you know, in the exact same situation and have to do the exact same thing as, you know, the, the previous protest you filed or what your, you know, your brother told you or your friend told you or your mentor told you. And the other thing is there's a lot of misconceptions out there about bid protests. Like I said, there's a lot of moving pieces and a lot of different rules depending on kind of where you are in the process, what type of procurement is involved, et cetera. So you might think that you know, quote unquote, the rules, and we're gonna see some examples of that as we go forward. But a lot of times, like what people think is the rule is actually a narrow exception to what the real rule is. And that causes a lot of contractors to make mistakes. So I wanna start now, before we move into the more complex parts of this presentation, with kind of the fundamental building blocks so that then we can build from there and you can understand the more complicated pieces and how all the moving parts kind of fit together. So the first thing to keep in mind in terms of fundamentals is the governing law. What law governs bid protests? Well, there is, like most things with federal government contracting, the Federal Acquisition Regulation, of course, the FAR, and applicable supplemental agency acquisition regulations. But when you're talking about the FAR, you can find the things dealing with bid protests um, in FAR Part 33. There's also stuff in there about REAs and claims, but bid protest is, is also part of part, excuse me, FAR Part 33. Um, depending on what issues come up in the protest, government contracting related statutes such as the Tucker Act or SECA, which is the Competition and Contracting Act, might also become involved in the arguments that you're making. Um, it's gonna really depend on you know, what type of arguments you're making and what the facts are. The small business regulations, um, you know, promulgated by the SBA and in some cases the VA, even though the VA regulations mostly at this point just point back over to the SBA regs in terms of definitions, um, that's obviously going to be the main source if you're talking about size and status protests. But even on our main topic today, bid protests, there are certain types of arguments that will necessitate you know, you to do some sort of analysis of the small business regs and eligibility, because sometimes that doesn't only relate to eligibility, but also can relate to, you know, the way the agency should have been doing things in terms of tiered evaluation or price preferences or things like that. So sometimes, you know, you still do have some involvement of the, the small business regulations. You also have to be cognizant of forum rules, and by that I mean the rules of the place, the forum, in which you file your bid protest, and we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. Um, and then the terms of the solicitation itself, you know, if, you know, on old Fed Biz Ops or, you know, Beta Sam now, you see a solicitation drop, you're going to see that the solicitation kind of outlines the way that the government is supposed to be evaluating um, you know, people who compete for the award, right? That is what you're going to want to measure what the government actually did against. You know, did they follow the evaluation scheme and the, the criteria and kind of the framework that was outlined in the solicitation or not? Now, is that law, quote unquote, governing law? Not exactly, but I put it on the slide because it is kind of a, you know, something that's been written down that is a, a concrete thing that you want to compare against what the agency did. The main questions are going to be, did the agency violate law? Did the agency, you know, di violate or diverge from or, you know, act in a manner contradictory to the terms of the solicitation in particular with regard to how to evaluate the, the people, you know, the contractors competing for an award. Other thing you want to keep in mind in terms of fundamentals are these critical considerations. Remember that I've, I've kind of alluded to the fact that, you know, the rules are different and you're in a different situation and the deadlines might be different depending on certain things. 
And when I say certain things, I mean things like who are you dealing with, what type of contract is at issue, and what method of procurement is going to be used. Um, and we're going to see how those things, you know, in real time and in concrete examples can affect certain things as we move on throughout this presentation. But I want to just kind of give you a little preview now so that you know what to look for as we move on to, you know, the, the higher conceptual levels of the presentation. So who you're dealing with? In other words, are you dealing with one agency? Is it a question of an agency procuring something on behalf of another agency? Is it a question of, you know, there's a government-wide acquisition contract, a GWAC, that one agency has issued, but now another agency has issued a task order or, you know, some sort of, you know, purchase order underneath of that or, you know, pursuant to that, uh, you know, GWAC. The reason that this becomes important is because there are certain distinctions. Well, first of all, it becomes important because of, you know, supplemental acquisition regs and the way that agencies do things differently. That's just a practical reason. But it also becomes important because there are certain rules in terms of bid protesting um, and, and debriefings and, and things that kind of are ancillary and tangential to bid protests that are going to differ depending on if you're dealing with a civilian or a defense agency. So really important to understand, you know, who are the, obviously it's easy if it's one standalone contract for the VA, for example, but sometimes it can be more complicated than that. Sometimes it can be the GSA procuring construction services on behalf of the Corps of Engineers or the Corps of Engineers managing a VA construction project or, a, you know, the Department of Veterans Affairs issuing a task order under an ESPC contract from the Department of Energy. Um, you know, there, there's all sorts of different things that can happen and you need to understand, you know, all of the agencies you're dealing with and kind of how their relationship uh, is structured based on this particular procurement. When I say type of contracted issue, is it an IDIQ, uh, you know, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity? Is it a task order? Is it a task order under an IDIQ that's just one agency? Is it a GWAC? I, I've said that before, government-wide acquisition contract. Is it a set-aside contract? Again, that will probably implicate size and status uh, protest issues, but it also can relate to bid protest issues. So you're going to want to be clear on what type of contract is at issue. And finally, what method of procurement is being used? And by that, I mean, is this a sealed bid situation under FAR Part 14? Because that's a situation in which the lowest bidder, as long as they're responsive and responsible, was supposed to get the job. And the debriefing rules, as you're going to see, are different. And the only arguments you're really going to be making are focused on price, most likely. Um, and, you know, compare that to, for example, contract by negotiation or a competitive procurement under FAR Part 15, where there are non-price evaluation factors and there's going to be some trade-off or best value decision. That's going to implicate a completely different set of potential protest bases. And under FAR Part 15, you get a debriefing and we're going to talk about all that in more detail. Um, you know, which changes your deadlines. So really important to understand what method of procurement is being used. And even within, um, you know, certain types of procurement, for example, within contracting by negotiation FAR 15, is this an LPTA, lowest price technically acceptable, um, where the government says, okay, you've got to at least be this good on your technical rating, but then once you kind of pass in, you know, you must be this tall to ride this ride. But once you get past that point, now we just go with lowest price. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is, you know, if there's a competitive range set up, sometimes with FAR Part 15, there is, sometimes there is not. And we're going to talk about that as we go forward as well. So it's important to keep all of that in mind. The last thing you need to know to kind of give you a baseline before we move on to the more complicated topics is the timeline. You know, the solicitation drops, that might be a request for proposals, might be an invitation for bids, it might be a request for quotation, depending on what type of procurement and what agency you're dealing with. Um, you might have an opportunity to ask Q&A, you might not. Uh, and then you're going to respond to the solicitation. Here's my bid, here's my proposal, here's my quotation. And then the government is going to engage in evaluation and source selection decision. As I said, you know, if there's a competitive range, set up under a FAR Part 15 procurement. There's going to be a little interim step there where the competitive range is set and there are discussions with the people who made it into the competitive range. But most of the time you're going to go through the evaluation process, then there's going to be an award decision. If it's a set-aside contract, the government is supposed to set out pre-award notices saying, hey, psst, 
we're about to award this contract to these guys. You know, if you've got a size or a status protest, now's your time to, you know, speak now or forever hold your peace. Otherwise, they're going to issue, uh, you know, an award and then there's going to be post award notices. And we're going to talk about kind of, you know, what each of these things can potentially trigger and how to recognize in your particular situation what it triggers and what you need to do next to maintain your protest rights. So the third thing, remember I mentioned that the forum rules, the rules of the place that you file your protest can matter. So bid protest tip three, make an informed decision regarding the forum that you choose. There are three primary places that bid protests are heard and adjudicated. If you're dealing with the FAA, you might also go to ODRA, but that's kind of outside the scope of most bid protests and what we're gonna be focusing on today. Um, you can file an agency level protest, which basically just goes to the contracting officer. You can go to the GAO, Government Accountability Office, or you can go to the Court of Federal Claims, COFC. Um, remember, bid protests are different than size and status protests. Size and status protests are gonna be filed with the contracting officer, um, and they're gonna go to then the SBA. Contracting officer is gonna send that along. Bid protests, however, you file at one of these three places. It makes sense to talk to your attorney in your particular case about which place makes the most sense. And you know whether you should file a GAO and then have a second chance at Court of Federal Claims, or if you start at the agency level and, and potentially get a second bite at the Apple at GAO. Costs are gonna be different. Um, there's different concerns in terms of you know, who's the agency counsel that's going to be involved um, and you know how familiar are certain forums with protests. Uh, the GAO handles protests all day long, every day. Court of Federal Claims does a fair amount of them, but that's not all that the Court of Federal Claims does, and not all of the Court of Federal Claims judges are, you know, former procurement attorneys. Um, contracting officer agency level protest, my own personal bias there is that they only ever work if it's a really obvious, like, clerical error that the agency can easily remedy. If you're trying to get into more analysis, they usually just back up the decision they just made. So usually, I think the default is you're probably gonna end up at GAO unless there's a reason to go to Court of Federal Claims, which sometimes there is. And depending on if it's a situation where there are multiple protesters, if one of them files at the Court of Federal Claims, the whole thing might be removed to Court of Federal Claims. If you've got multiple protesters that file at GAO, it might be consolidated or it might not be, depending on what the various protest arguments are before the GAO. But this is definitely a conversation you should have with your lawyer. You can talk through the options, the benefits and the drawbacks of going to each, and then decide where you want to file. Um, because you know there are differences in terms of how fast things get done and how much things can cost and how much help you might get from the agency council, et cetera. Bid protest tip number four. Here is where we get into trying to identify the various deadlines and kind of jump off points or, or trigger or catalyst moments to file your protest. The threshold consideration here is that you have to understand, and I've kind of hinted at this already, that there are different deadlines and different procedures depending on what type of protest you're talking about. And I, in, in this way, I don't mean type of protest, bid protest versus size and status, I mean, even within bid protests, there are different type of bid protests. Um, for example, there are pre-award protests based on errors in the solicitation. In other words, the solicitation drops and you think that there's something funky in the solicitation itself. Um, there are pre-award protests if you are excluded from the competitive range. And then there are post-award protests when you're talking about, okay, the award has already been made. There are different deadlines for filing protests, A, in different forums, but B, depending on the different types of situational contracts. Most contractors think they're familiar with the rule, which is, hey, the protester must file its protest not later than 10 days after. And if you ask most contractors, they would say the debriefing. We will see in a few slides that that is not the correct rule. <laughs> Um, the general rule, and we're going to caveat that in a second, is 10 days after the basis of the protest is known or should have been known, debriefing 10 days is an exception to that rule. And also, even though you're calling it a general rule, that's not the rule that applies to pre-award protests. 
So very important to properly identify, you know, whether you got a size or status protest versus a bid protest. And then within bid protest land, understand what type of bid protest you have. So when you are talking about pre-award protests based on the solicitation terms, the deadline is not 10 days from the day you know or should have known. It's not 10 days from the day you got the debriefing. It's that you have to bring the protest before the deadline to respond to the solicitation. And depending on how you run things and how much lead time there is, that might mean that you are getting a protest ready while you are also saying, but we also at least have to try in case we lose the protest to respond to the solicitation and get a bid or a proposal or a quote in. Sometimes you're gonna be running on parallel tracks and you're gonna be doing a lot at once. When I say a pre-award protest based on the term of a solicitation, what kind of things am I talking about? I'm talking about ambiguous or contradictory terms. You know, there's something in section M of the uh, solicitation that is directly contradictory to something in section E. Um, you know, different page limits, or you tell me a different evaluation factor, or you tell me something different about how many past performance projects you need and what the value needs to be. Um, and I, you know, I tried to clear that up in the Q&A and I, I didn't get anywhere. So I need to file a protest to have you clarify what is going on here. Um, you know, I had one just recently where the specifications said something different than the drawings, said something different than what was in the scope of work. Um, those are the types of things you want to look out for. Um, inclusion of prohibited terms, exclusion of required terms. Um, one of the big ones that you see a lot is unduly or overly restrictive terms. In other words, if you think they're being too narrow, the agency is being too narrow in what they are asking for or making it kind of unfairly um, aimed at one particular contractor or one particular type of contractor, they're really not, you know, as they're supposed to make this full and fair and open competition. I talked a little bit about LPTA, lowest price technically acceptable. Um, note that <laughs> there are rules in recent years that tried to restrict the use of LPTA. Agencies were using it a little bit too much um, and contractors didn't like that and contractors pushed back and contractors got some traction and contractors got some results in that the regulations were kind of modified to say, hey, you know, LPTA is not appropriate in these circumstances. Sometimes agencies are still trying to use it in times and, you know, circumstances where it's not appropriate. That would be a place to file, you know, hey, the solicitation is, is faulty, so we're going to protest, we're going to do a pre-award protest challenging the solicitation terms. Um, anything where you're arguing uh, that something you know should have been set aside but was not, or perhaps that they should not have been set aside or it was. That's obviously less common, especially for you guys out there who are you know veteran owned and service disabled veteran owned. Obviously, because well, I shouldn't say obviously, um, the the VA has an additional obligation. All the agencies are supposed to do kind of market research when there's a procurement coming out. And if they think there's two types, you know, two small businesses or two types of a small business, two at 2 8A, two hub zone, two women owned, um, that could perform uh, a job, they're supposed to consider and, you know, try to set it aside for that type of business. It's called the rule of two. It's aspirational for most agencies. For the VA, it's mandatory in most cases that they have to set it aside for SDVOSBs unless they, you know, there aren't two SDVOSBs that could compete or, you know, have the capabilities to do this job. You will sometimes hear that referred to as kingdomware issues, set aside issues, rule of two issues. They're all the same thing. They're all about the fact that the agency should have set something aside and they didn't. You'll see them most often in the context of the VA because the VA is subject to stricter rules regarding STVOSB set-asides. Um, and, you know, this is the time to argue that when the solicitation drops and it's, you know, that little box next to set-aside is not checked off, this is where you would challenge it. Um, there's also a, a kind of a, a conceptual thing about if they put, if the agency in the solicitation has certain, you know, go, no-go, pass, no-pass, acceptable, unacceptable, you get booted out if you've got an unsat or unacceptable. And if it relates to things that are typically within the purview of the um, SBA's certificate of competency, like responsibility or capabilities, that can be seen as a de facto responsibility determination that's improperly taking jurisdiction away from the SBA. And that can be another basis in a set-aside contract if you are a small business to challenge a solicitation.
Now, this is obviously not an exclusive list of everything that could be challenged, but hopefully this gives you an idea of the types of things I'm talking about when I say you take a look at the solicitation and you go, something is not right here. And again, remember, you need to protest this before the deadline to respond. Now, that doesn't mean that you might not also be submitting a response just to kind of cover all your bases in case the protest is not successful, but what it does mean is what you absolutely should not do is hold off on a protest and just submit your response to the solicitation, your bid, your proposal, your quotation, et cetera, and then say, well, if we win, great. If we don't, then we'll protest. Eh -eh. If you roll the dice and try to protest later, you know, if it doesn't work out in your favor, it's going to be too late. Your protest is going to be dismissed. You've waived your ability to protest. So do not roll the dice, do not hedge. If you have one of these issues, file your protest early before you file your response to the solicitation. Um, there are other pre-award scenarios. Again, most of them involve when you're excluded from the competitive range. I, I mentioned that briefly before, but competitive range is when in a FAR Part 15 procurement, the government says, and what they usually do is reserve their right to make an award based on the proposals that they get. But, you know, if the government determines it's necessary, we will open discussions and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So what they leave themselves the kind of wiggle room to do is to say, you know, we don't love anyone's proposal. We think they all could be improved and it would be, you know, in the interest of the government to maybe have people try again. <laughs> And so in that case, what they do is they select a competitive range. Let's say 20 people submitted proposals for the project. Maybe they'll pick five or, or seven or 15, depending on, you know, it's, it's pretty discretionary. Um, unless the solicitation specifically outlines a number, and then they've got to stick with whatever they said they were going to do. But again, most of the time, the solicitation just says, we think we're going to award it without discussions, but we reserve the right to open discussions. What discussions means is that those group of contractors that are selected for the competitive range, that five out of 20 or that seven out of 20 or that 15 out of 20, they'll get a notice saying, you know, hey, you know, you were put in the competitive range. Uh, we want to talk to you. Everyone else will get a notice that they have now been excluded from the competitive range. You know, thanks for playing. Don't pass go. Don't collect $200. Better luck next time. You know, we look forward to you bidding on other projects, but you're out of the running for now. And we're going to talk about, you know, what happens to you if you are excluded from the competitive range in just a second. But what happens to you if you are in the competitive range is that the government has discussions with each competitive range contractor and says, hey, uh, you know, these are the issues that we found with your proposal. Improve it. Get me a revised or a best and final uh, proposal. Then everyone submits, you know, their new revised proposals, and then an award decision is made on the basis of those revised proposals. But if you are excluded from the competitive range, that is when you need to start thinking about your options. You don't want to wait until the procurement goes all the way through to the end, and then there's an award, and then say, okay, now what do we do? You've got to take action when you get that notice that you were excluded from the competitive range. And we're going to talk about that in just a little bit, but I wanted to at least kind of foreshadow it here so that it was tied in when you're thinking of pre-award protests and times where you're not thinking about post-award deadlines. Just keep in mind, you know, situation one, when they're based on errors in the solicitation, the deadline is, you know, before the, the, the deadline to respond to the solicitation that you're saying is messed up. And number two, competitive range, which we're going to talk about a little bit more as we go forward. Now, the other filing deadline differences I kind of talked about briefly before, but it's that general rule versus the exception. The general rule rule is that the protester, you know, when it's not a pre-award protest based on differences, uh, you know, errors in the solicitation, then the general rule is you've got to file no later than 10 days after the basis of the protest is known or should have been known, whichever is earlier which basically means they're going to make you responsible for stuff that you should have known, even if you didn't technically know it. So what does that mean in plain English? You should talk to your attorney because every circumstance is different, but most of the time that's going to be 10 days from the day you got the notice of award, 10 days from the day that you first knew you didn't got it. You didn't got it. You didn't get it. And somebody else did. The exception to that rule 
that unfortunately a lot of contractors think is the rule is that instead of 10 days from you know the day that you know or should have known your protest if you're talking about a procurement that was competitive proposals far part 15 or you know a, a task order incorporating far part 15 procedures etc we're going to talk about that in just a little bit if you're in that scenario, that world. Remember, one of the key considerations we talked about up front is, you know, what type of procurement is this? What part of the FAR is it under? If you are in a type of procurement under a section of the FAR where a debriefing is required and you timely request, you're not late, you timely request that required debriefing, then the rule is that you file it no later than 10 days after the debriefing. So obviously then the question becomes, well, how do I know if I'm in the world where a debriefing is required? How do I know if I'm in the world where a debriefing is not required and I have to start clicking my 10 days, you know, or counting my 10 days, I should say, from the day I got the award notice? Well, the simple rule is that de debriefings are required for competitive procurements under FAR Part 15 under FAR 16505B6, you know, certain task orders under certain or over certain dollar amounts are going to follow FAR Part 15 procedures and they're going to get a debrief. But they're not required, debriefings are not required for GSA scheduled procurements under FAR Part 8, sealed bidding acquisitions under FAR Part 14, commercial item procurements under FAR Part 12, simplified acquisition procurements under FAR Part 13. Now, this can get a little complicated because sometimes, especially when the agencies do, you know, their weird Frankenstein monstering of, you know, commercial items and competitive procurements together, you've got to be pretty careful and you got to have an attorney review with you to see if FAR Part 15 procedures were incorporated or not and talk about, you know, should we err on the side of being early? Should we err on the side of being late? Um, you know, that's a question you're going to go through. But generally, if it's not a competitive procurement or a task order, you know, that's subject to competitive procurement debriefing procedures, you don't have a required debriefing. And it's not 10 days from the day that you get the debriefing, it's 10 days from the day you got the notice of award. Now, in FAR Part 8 or FAR Part 13 procurements, um, in, under certain circumstances, you are entitled to, quote unquote, a brief explanation. The fact that the government calls that a debriefing half the time does not make it a debriefing. It means that the contracting officers don't know the FAR that well. Um, the fact that even if it's not a required debriefing and you ask for one, if the government agrees to give you one, that's great. But, you know, a, a brief explanation and a debriefing that's given, even though it isn't required, does not toll the deadline. It doesn't make you, you know, move from the general rule over to the exception. It just means that you're getting more information, but you're still subject to that general rule, which is 10 days after the basis of the protest is known or should have been known. The second question is then, okay, well, I'm in the world where it is a required debriefing. How do I make sure that I timely request it? And this is where we're going to loop back to that competitive range discussion. So timely requesting a debriefing depends on what situation you're in. If you got a notice saying you were out of the competitive range, remember I said, don't wait until the procurement is all the way over and you get, you know, hey, the award went to XYZ and not you. When you get the notice saying that you were excluded from the competitive range, that is when you ask for your debriefing in writing within three days. If it's a post-award context, you're going to ask for your debriefing in writing within three days of the day you get the notice of unsuccessful offer, the day you get the, you know, notice of award to one of your competitors. So that is how you timely request a debriefing. Now, be aware that sometimes, even if you timely request your debriefing three days after you're kicked out of the competitive range, the government might say, yep, that's great. You've got your foot in the door. You were timely. We're not going to give you that debriefing until we're all the way down at the end of the process. That's fine. But you just need to make sure you do what you need to do within that three-day window. If the government then delays between that and giving you the debriefing, that doesn't change the rule. But if you wait to request your debriefing, then you're late. If the delay is on your side, you're out of luck. If the delay is on the government side, you've at least preserved your rights to do what you need to do at a later date. So again, always keep your eye on these things. Anytime you get a paper, you should really be thinking, 
does this trigger anything? Do I need to file anything? Do I need to ask for anything? What do I need to do to preserve my protest rights? So, to sum up, <laughs> required timely requested debriefing scenarios, that's when you're gonna have 10 days from the day the debriefing is held. Let's add a further complication. <laughs> and I'm sorry, there's no way to make this simpler. As you can see, bid protests are um, you know, a very complicated with a lot of moving pieces and a lot of things to keep in mind kind of analysis. If you are in a required timely debriefing, uh, re required timely requested debriefing scenario, remember the rule is 10 days from the day the debriefing is held. What complicates that is what's the day that the debriefing, quote unquote, is held? This is where that consideration of, am I dealing with a civilian agency or a defense agency is gonna come up? The reason for that is that the DOD years ago issued an enhanced debriefing deviation to the FAR, which then was incorporated into the FAR. And what it says, and the reason was that they didn't think agencies were being forthcoming enough with certain debriefing information, what it says is agencies that are under the defense umbrella, so any of the armed services agencies, you know, any of the, the agencies you deal with that are not civilian agencies, when you get a debrief, whether it's written, telephonic, what have you, you have two business days to submit additional questions. When you get the answers to those questions, that is considered the close of debriefing, and that's when the stopwatch starts ticking. So if you get notice of award on a Monday, you request a debriefing on Tuesday, you get the debriefing on Friday, you ask additional questions the following Monday, and you don't hear back until the, you know, that Friday, your deadline to file starts ticking that second Friday, even though at that point you're almost two weeks away from the day you got the notice of award. Compare that to if you're, you know, a non, you know, a sealed bidding thing where, you know, it's not a required debriefing situation. It's 10 days from that first Monday that you got the notice of award. So you can see how wildly different your deadlines can be depending on, okay, am I entitled to a debriefing? Okay, did I get the debriefing? Okay, am I entitled to ask those additional questions and have that additional window of time be open? Very different scenarios, which is why it's so important to understand who are you dealing with, what type of procurement this is, and all the implications that stem from the answers to those questions. Other thing to keep in mind is you don't just automatically get those extra days because it's a Department of Defense procurement. If you get your debriefing on a Monday and you don't ask any questions, your deadline starts ticking when the debriefing is over. You have to actually ask those questions and then wait for the responses um, you know, for that additional time period to kick in. And there were a bunch of cases on that when the enhanced debriefing first started happening because people were just like, oh, I just build in extra time. No, it's time for you to ask more questions. If you take advantage of that, then you get more time. So let's sum up what we know so far, and then I'm going to add a further consideration for your uh, review. What we know so far, you get a solicitation, there's a problem with the solicitation. There's, it's, um, it's ambiguous, it's unduly restrictive, it's, it should be set aside, but it's not. It's improper use of LPTA. Any of the issues we talked about or you know, any issues that are basically, hey, there's something messed up in this solicitation, you file that before the solicitation response date. Everything else is 10 days from, if it's a required requested timely debriefing, 10 days from the debriefing. If it's a DOD enhanced debriefing situation, remember that that means when you get your questions back after you follow up after the debriefing. If you're not DOD, it's gonna be 10 days from the day you get the debriefing. Um, everything else is 10 days from the day you know or should have known the basis of your protest, which most of the time is going to be the day you got the notice of award. The new wrinkle is those 10 day deadlines are what you need to do to be timely. In other words, what you need to do for uh, you know your, your protest not to get kicked out as just being, I'm sorry, you're late, we're not even gonna consider this. But what if you want a stay? And by a stay, I mean, you're filing a protest, you think that the government messed up and gave this contract to your competitor who should not have been awarded the contract, you should have been awarded the contract, you file and you know it's gonna take you know a couple months to get a decision, you don't want the notice to proceed issued, you don't want your competitor who should never have gotten the competition, the contract in the first place, starting to perform the work 
while you figure out if they they or you should be the ones performing. You want everything paused. That is a stay. You want the procurement stayed pending the outcome of the protest litigation. Now, there are certain times where the agency for emergencies and national security and things like that can override the stay. But if you file at the GAO within five days, so all the times that we've talked about 10 days, whoop, shorten that down to five. If you do that within five days, you automatically get a stay of procurement, again, unless the government has some sort of overwhelming emergency need or it's a matter of national security. All of the deadlines we've been talking about thus far are GAO deadlines. The Court of Federal Claims, you don't technically have these strict deadlines, but generally, you know, if you're a protester, you want to get it in as soon as possible. So it's usually best to stick to as close to these deadlines as you can. Plus that way, if there's other protesters and they're filing a GAO, you can kind of keep track of what's going on. But when you're talking about the Court of Federal Claims, technically, remember I said forum rules is an important part of this. You don't have the 10-day, the 10-day, 10 10-day 10 rigid deadlines, but you also don't have the benefit of the automatic stay. Even if you filed super quick, even if you file within five days at the Court of Federal Claims, you actually have to file, your lawyer has to file motions for preliminary injunctions and temporary restraining orders and a memorandum of law. And usually there have to be signed affidavits in support of that. So it can get a lot more expensive, a lot quicker, so that is another reason why a lot of people, people, a lot of times contractors prefer the GAO. Remember I said, you always wanna to talk to your lawyer about in your case, where it's gonna be best to file your protest. But a lot of times the fact that you can get an automatic stay if you do it within five days at GAO means people wanna file at the GAO and they wanna file within five days. So keep in mind, different deadlines for different types of protests, different deadlines if you're dealing with required debriefings or not, different deadlines depending on if you're dealing with a DOD debriefing or not, and different deadlines, 10 versus five, if you're not just trying to get the protest in on time, but you're trying to get it in early enough to get a stay. All of this you know, is just goes into the initial, so when do I have to file by <laughs> analysis. The substantive analysis that you need to do or your lawyer needs to do is, well, what am I protesting? What did the agency do wrong? What am I saying the agency messed up such that someone else got the award when I should have? Now, unsurprisingly, again, that's gonna depend on the type of procurement or what section of the FAR that you're under. Like I said earlier, if you're FAR part 14, that's lowest priced bidder, you know, responsive and responsible bidder. So most of the time, it's gonna be a question of price. You don't have non-price evaluation factors you know, at play in a FAR Part 14 sealed bidding procurement. Um, if you do though, if you're FAR Part 15 or if you're commercial items where they've you know, they've done uh, you know evaluation criteria, you're going to be looking at non-price evaluation factors, technical requirements, key personnel, past performance, staffing, you know, depending on what was in the solicitation. The solicitation is going to outline what those non-price evaluation factors are and the sub-factors are. Um, you know, how they're going to be evaluated, how they're going to assign strengths, weaknesses, deficiencies, if that's something they're doing, what the definition of the adjectival ratings are, you know, un unsatisfactory, marginal. Sometimes they're going to tie that to numbers of strengths. Sometimes they're going to leave it super vague and give themselves a ton of wiggle room. But it's always a question of comparing what the government did with what they said they were going to do in the solicitation and what the law requires them to do. So did the agency follow the solicitation stated evaluation scheme? Did the agency comply with, follow, um, you know, versus did they contradict or violate applicable law? And the solicitation is going to tell you how each factor is going to be evaluated, the ratings that are going to be assigned, the relative importance of the factors to each other. In other words, technical is more important than past performance or technical is equally important to uh, you know, past performance. And they're also gonna say how price figures in. You know, Technical is more important than past performance, which is more important than price. Technical and past performance are of equal importance, but put together, they're significantly more important than price. That's gonna be solicitation specific, and you need to take a look at what the solicitation said.
you're going to look at issues like, you know, did the agency use an unstated evaluation criteria? Did they not apply the evaluation criteria or assign ratings the way that they said they were going to in the solicitation? You know, I was assigned three strengths. They said that anything with two strengths was going to be rated at least good. I got a marginal. That's not consistent. Was there unequal or disparate treatment of offerers? So this is weird. I have three past performance projects, all of which had excellent CPARs, all of which were over $10 million, and I got rated good. But my competitor has two projects, one termination for default, bad CPARs ratings, and they were all $1 million or below, and you also rated them as good. Hmm. That seems like perhaps you were downgrading me and upgrading them, even though we have vastly different past performance and there's no way that without disparate treatment, we would have been rated the same thing. Meaningful, misleading, uneven discussions is something that relates to those competitive range situations. Remember, I said the government goes back and opens discussions with the people who are in the competitive range. They need to be even-handed and fair with that. They can't basically tell one person, let me sit down with you and in three hours go over every way we want you to improve your, your proposal and then have some other people just be like, yeah, we didn't like your proposal, figure it out. Obviously, that's going to give one person a greater benefit when they do a revised proposal. That's, you know, on even discussions. You also have to make sure, the agency has to make sure they're having meaningful and mislead and not misleading. In other words, they actually have to advise people as to the major problems that need revision, um, and they can't leave things out to try to help other contractors. Price evaluation issues are going to be reasonableness, realism. You know, was es escalation allowed? Did they escalate the prices properly? Um, was there balanced pricing? Was, you know, if the hub zone preference is involved, is that, uh, you know, something that was was used properly. Um, and again, not exclusive lists, but these are the types of issues you're going to be looking for, and your lawyer is going to be able to help you figure out, you know, how to see what happened and see if you've got any basis. The biggest way that you're going to information gather with regard to all of those questions and, you know, with regard to seeing if you've got one of those issues or more than one of those issues to protest is in your debriefing. Now we've talked about how debriefings impact your protest deadlines, but we haven't talked about debriefings themselves. The key thing to understand is what you will and will not get in a debriefing. There's a difference between pre-award debriefings, and again, this is mostly gonna come up in a scenario where you got excluded from the competitive range, you timely got your request for a debriefing in within three days, and then you get your debriefing as opposed to the government delaying it until post-award. You're going to get a lot less information at a pre-award debriefing. You're going to get agency's evaluation of the significant elements of your proposal, a summary of rationale of why you were eliminated, and then you're going to get to ask relevant questions and they're going to have to provide reasonable responses. They're not going to give you the number of offers, identity of other offers, contents of other offers, proposals, the ranking of other offers, anything about the evaluation of other offers, and then they're not going to give you any sort of trade secret or privileged confidential, you know, et cetera, information. Post-award debriefings, you get a little bit more, but you still don't get as much as the contractors necessarily think you do. You get the government's evaluation of any significant weaknesses or deficiencies in your proposal. You're going to get the overall evaluated cost or price and overall technical rating of both you and the awardee. You're going to get past performance information about you, but not necessarily about the awardee. If an overall ranking was developed with agencies, very rarely do anymore, you're entitled to that, and you're entitled to a summary of the rationale for award. I've seen anything from you know, a long two-page explanation of the best value trade-off they did to more commonly a one-sentence thing that says the awardee presented the best value consistent with FAR Part 15, that's why they got the award. Really depends on the agency you're dealing with. If you're talking about commercial items, you're gonna get you know, a make and model of the item and again, you are entitled to ask relevant questions and get reasonable responses to those questions within the confines outlined in this section. Debriefing's not going to be a point-by-point -point comparison of your offer with the other offers, and the debriefing's again not going to reveal any you know, information that's exempt from release under FOIA or trade secrets or privileged or confidential or proprietary or financial information, etc. In terms of how are debriefings given, remember, um, they can be given in person, which is very rare 
now and even was rare before COVID, or more often either telephonically or in a written form. Now, if you're dealing with a DOD situation where you've got that extra two days to ask your reasonable questions and get, or I'm sorry, ask your relevant questions and get reasonable responses, then you don't really have to worry about submitting questions ahead of time if you're gonna get a written debrief, right? But if you're gonna get a written debrief from another agency, when are you gonna have those questions answered? You wanna try to get your questions in beforehand so that there's no going back and forth after because when it's not a DOD procurement, you don't have that extra window. Once the debrief is concluded, it's concluded. So you wanna take advantage of your uh, you know, ability to ask questions if you know you're getting a written debrief. So again, something to talk about with your lawyer you know, as you're preparing to request your debrief after you've gotten your notice of unsuccessful offer or your notice of exclusion from the competitive range. Um, in terms of who should attend, I generally say lawyers should not be there. This is an information gathering tool. People clam up when lawyers are around. Um, so as much as I love myself and my peers and colleagues out there, we tend to have a chilling effect on how much information the agency is gonna share with you. So I would recommend you prepare with your lawyer ahead of time, you prepare questions ahead of time, you work with your attorney to understand the most important things you're looking for, and then you go ahead without your attorney. Of course, if my clients want me there, I'm there. You always have to tell the, the agency, so none of this, you should be on the line, but we won't say that you're there, absolutely not. You need to tell the agency the council's gonna be present, but a lot of times, I don't think it's a great idea to have council present as long as you've been prepped and you know the debriefing questions have been prepared in advance. Obviously, you always want to be professional and polite. You wanna avoid taking you know combative stances, both because it's just not gonna get you anywhere, and B, because strategically, the, the ruder you are and the more it seems like you're attacking them, the less information you're gonna get, which actually means the less stuff you're gonna have to put in your protest, which actually means the less likely you are to win a protest. So you always wanna keep that in mind, you know, more flies with, uh, with honey. Um, pro tip, get a debriefing even if you win. That's obviously a little bit outside of the, the scope of what we're talking about today, but it, it, it's really a good piece of advice. Um, you know, I guarantee you, even if you won, you didn't do everything perfectly, you might as well learn what you can improve for next time. And also you're gonna learn a little bit about how this agency thinks, which is gonna help you formulate, um, you know, how you put together your bid or your proposal next time. So final tip on the protester side, know when to fold them. Don't pursue a, no, a, a losing protest. Not all protests are considered equal not of them have not all of them have an equal chance of winning. Um, you're going to want to think about jurisdictional concerns. The biggest thing here is if you've got a task order that's under ten million dollars, if it's a civilian agency or under twenty five million dollars, if it's a defense agency, again, another one of those places where you know what type of agency you're dealing with makes a difference, you can't protest. <laughs> um, there are jurisdiction and you can't take task order protests to the Court of Federal Claims. You have to go to GAO. Um, and you can only do it if you're over those dollar thresholds. And then obviously the question becomes, well, what if you know the, the wardee was over that dollar threshold, but you're underneath it? There, there's complications there too. But generally speaking, you know that that's a, a limit. That if you're not over the task order limit, you can't protest. It's not even worth filing. It'll just be dismissed. No one will ever even look at what your arguments are. Standing. Not everyone can protest. You have to be an interested party. You have to be able to show that you would be next in line or have a substantial chance at award if the agency hadn't made this error. You also have to show competitive prejudice, which basically is even if you show that the government really messed up, is the mess up going to make a difference? If I was rated worse than the awardee on seven different factors and I can prove that the government made the biggest mistake known to man on three of them, great, even if that's fixed, I'm still rated worse than the awardee on four factors, they still get the award, let's not waste anyone's time or judicial resources, that protest is gonna be dismissed. Even if you think the protest might be winnable, you're gonna wanna talk cost-benefit analysis, You know how much is it gonna cost us to get there, and you're gonna talk about what does a win look like. When you win a protest, you don't get the award. You get the GAO saying, all right, agency, go back and do a new source selection decision. That could very well result in an award to you. It could result in them making an award to the same person that got it again, but just doing it the right way. Or it could result in the third party getting an award. 
So you're really going to want to talk about with your attorney, you know, what are the chances of me actually ending up with an award at the end of all of this, as opposed to what are the chances of me winning a protest and helping one of my competitors out? So you really want to think about that and, you know, not make an emotional decision, but make a, a rational decision based on how likely your protest is to succeed and, you know, how much is it going to cost you? You're not going to want to pursue protests that are mostly just subjective. I should have been rated higher than that. You're going to want to show apples to apples comparisons. The more objective you can be, the more likely it is that you're going to win. Um, you can kind of take it in stages, talk about with your lawyer, all right, let's file the bid protest because we know something is fishy here. The way it works is once you file the bid protest, if there's any basis for a motion to dismiss on you know, jurisdiction or standing or competitive protests or prejudice, those will be filed. If there's not, there's not going to be any motion filed. Once you get past that stage, it's going to be that the agency has 30 days from the day of the protest being filed to do the agency or the record or report. Then the protester has 10 days to file their comments, which basically say, see, this is everything in the agency record, which is all the documents dealing with the source selection decision that back up what I was saying. Something is fishy here. And then there could be more briefing. And then ultimately within 90 days, or I'm sorry, 100 days, the GAO decides the whole protest, right? So when you're talking about, look, there's something weird here. This is how much it's going to cost to file a protest and at least get to the point where I can look at the agency record and tell you, yes, we have a good argument. Let's go forward with this or no, you know, it was worth the investment to try. But now that I see the whole record, there really isn't enough here to go on. You wouldn't win this protest. We might as well drop it now. So those are things to talk about with your lawyer. You know, how likely am I to win? Do we know how likely? What can we do to get to the next stage so we can figure out how likely can we talk about budget and next steps kind of, you know, in incremental pieces. The other thing to keep in mind is a lot of protests don't go all the way through. They don't go all the way through to the GAO making a decision. They go through to the agency saying, oh, maybe we did mess up. We're going to take corrective action. So when you look at the statistics of how many protests are successful, that doesn't take into account how many times the agency goes, oh, we're not going to wait for the GAO to slap our wrists and tell us we did something wrong or the Court of Federal Claims, you know, as the case may be. We're, we're, we're just going to fix this. So we're going to go back to the drawing board and, you know, how far they go back is going to depend on what you alleged was wrong. Sometimes it's going to be we're going to reconsider price. Sometimes it's going to be we're going to reconsider everything. Sometimes it's going to be we're actually canceling the solicitation and reissuing it and fixing this issue. It's going to, you know, what what's quote unquote corrective is going to depend on what the alleged error was. So all things to keep in mind when you're trying to figure out if it makes sense to file a protest. Obviously, the biggest thing you probably should take from this is this is a complicated area. Um, and my goal for today was to kind of give you the tools to spot where you need to know, oh, this is one of those dangerous areas where there's a lot of moving pieces and a lot of questions that need to be answered. I need to pick up the phone and call an attorney that is familiar with bid protests that can walk me through this protest, pr uh, process, make sure I'm filing you know, my debriefing request when I need to, make sure that I'm now prepped to ask the right questions in the debriefing, make sure I understand how quickly we need to file the protest, make sure I understand am I likely to win or is this a waste of money. So all things you should be thinking about if you're a protester. Now, we're going to finish up, and I know we're running a little bit long, so I'll cover this quickly, but we're going to flip now to the other side. You've gotten an award. Yay! And then three days later, oh, you get notice that you've been protested. Someone else filed a protest against your award. Now, intervention, again, remember, bid protests, technically alleging that the agency did something wrong. You've been the beneficiary of that because the agency's, you know, alleged error got you an award. But it's not against you. You didn't do anything wrong. The case is that the agency did something wrong. So the agency steps up to defend the award that was made. If you're at the Court of Federal Claims, that's going to be DOJ working with agency counsel. If you're at the GAO, it's going to be agency counsel. Now, a lot of clients and people ask me, well, if the government steps up, why wouldn't I just sit back and let them? Why should I hire a lawyer? Why should I be involved? And the answer is because you need to protect your rights. All sorts of funky stuff can happen, and you need to at least be monitoring the situation. You don't have to spend a lot to monitor the situation. 
Um, the other reason is that, remember how I just said sometimes the agency can decide we're gonna take corrective action? You wanna have a say in that process. The agency might go, ugh, I'm tired, I don't feel like fighting for that award. And you might say, uh, no, I, I think there's a basis to fight for my award and I think there's a motion to dismiss we can file. Why aren't we doing that? Why would we just like give up and roll over? Like, that's great that you have a beach vacation coming up, but I wanna fight. So, and obviously I'm being a little bit facetious there, but you know, your interests are aligned when the government first gets the protest, they might not stay aligned. So you want to be in the process you want to be monitoring what's going on. You want to have a voice in what happens to your award to the extent possible. So the way you do that is by intervening. It's very, very simple to intervene. You basically file a one-page motion or a one-page notice, depending on where you're at, saying, I'm the awardee, I wanna be involved. And then you get access to the docket and then you file your you know, access to the protective order application and then you're in. And then, you know, I can, on behalf of my client, reach out to agency counsel and say, what are you thinking here? Are we doing a motion to dismiss? You know, what's going to be in the agency record? And you can kind of work together. And a lot of times I go, I call my client and say, yeah, you know, I filed that one pager. It took me, a, it took me an hour. Um, you know, I talked to the government attorney. That took me 20 minutes. And I'm confident that they're doing everything they need to. We can just sit back and watch them. You, you don't have to spend anything on me writing a brief. Or if I talk to the agency counsel and they're brand new and they don't know what they're doing or they're overworked and maybe they don't seem like they've got the best handle on the case, I say, no, we got to step up and it's, you are going to have to spend a little bit more on legal fees. But the benefit is that we're going to be covering your, you know, covering your interests a lot more than if we were just relying on the government. But your, your foot's in the door. You can monitor. You can talk about how much effort and modulate your costs from there. But you have a voice and you are, you know, you're not blind to what's going on. You're not all of a sudden like told on Tuesday, oh, the protest went this way and your word went away. Sorry, you never wanna be in that scenario. So that's kind of the, the, the main thing to keep in mind when you're an intervener. And then obviously you saw how complicated the process is. You saw how many potential ways it is there is to mess it up. So when you're an intervener, you wanna be looking at all the things I just said a protester has to do and saying, well, what did they mess up? How can I get their protest kicked out? It's basically just looking at everything through the reverse lens. So bonus tip, this is a complicated and nuanced and funky area of the law that takes a lot of experience to kind of navigate. It's not, you know, even though everyone says they know big protests, there's a lot of misconceptions out there. Like I said, a lot of people think that the, the exceptions are the rules. A lot of people don't know the differences between the types of protests. So don't be afraid to seek guidance or ask for help whether it's through you know, an interest group or whether it's through an attorney, but it really does, you know, in this area in particular, make sense to engage an attorney and talk to someone who knows bid protests. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Earl to see what questions, if any, we got. But if we don't get to your question today, or if, we, um, if you don't wanna ask your question in this public forum, like I said, you can feel free to reach out to me. You've got my information on the screen. You know, if you've got protest, about, uh, protest questions, if you've got questions about anything else, federal government contracting, feel free to reach out to me or, or connect with me on my social media that's on there as well. Okay. I mean, that's a lot of information. I'm trying to soak that all in. Um, <laughs> guess what? I unmute muting everybody. So if you want to ask a question, you don't have to type it in. You could ask away. So I'm gonna give you a few minutes to go ahead and find your questions. And go ahead and ask Maria anything you want. So let's give it a few minutes. So while we're waiting for questions to come in, I'll just, I guess, close the loop on size and status protests as well. Um, again, not the main topic for today, but size and status protests, the deadlines are different. Remember I said you don't go to GAO or Court of Federal Claims. Um, you go to the contracting officer who then in turn sends the, the protest to the SBA and then uh, less often frequency of the VA. Um, you have to file within five days of getting that pre-award notice, or if the agency messes up and doesn't send that, then getting the award notice. The other big difference from the intervener side, um, even though it's not technically called intervention when it's a size or status protest, is that remember, it's no longer about the agency doing something wrong. Size and status protests are about your eligibility, so nobody steps up to defend your award. It's on you. 
you're going to get something from the SBA that asks for a whole bunch of documentation and probably gives you something like three days to get it together. They'll usually grant you an extension, though, if you reach out, pro tip. Um, but it's not like bid protests where the agency steps in to defend the award. It's on you to advocate for your eligibility, respond to anything that the you know size or status protest said about potential challenges to your eligibility, get the SBA whatever paperwork they need, and then go from there. On the flip side, if you're a protester for size and status protests, once you file, your work is done. It's not like bid protests where there's additional briefing and you have to review all the documents. You basically file your protest, you push it over to the contracting officer, they push it to the SBA, and the SBA takes it from there. So other major differences you know, between bid protests and size and status protests, and obviously if you have questions about that, I'm happy to take those as well. Okay. We seem like we have no questions for this webinar. So, okay, um, just a reminder, I will send out the recording and the slides to you by Monday. If you have any questions regarding this topic, please, you have Maria's information right there, please feel free to contact her anytime. So, Maria, thank you so much for being part of this webinar and it shows all about big protests. I know this is not the first time you've done Charlie and Mike, you've done several videos for us, so please, my sincere thanks to you for, for taking a busy time out of your schedule to teach us about protest. No, oh, thank you so much, Earl, and, and okay, on the SBC, and thanks to everyone out there for joining us. Have a good one. Enjoy the rest of your week. Okay, everybody, take care, stay cool, and <laughs> I will send out the links to those webinars in August and the video and the slides. Thank you so much, everybody. Take care. <laughs>